all look ready to sing, so why don't you stand up and sing too? Welcome to church. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Worship our Savior on the day that he chose to sacrifice himself for us. If you're visiting with us this morning, first of all, welcome. And in the back of your bulletin, there's a small... Sorry. There's a, a small... Uh, tarot sheet that you're welcome to <coughs> fill out and put that in the offering basket. And also, there's a booklet just like this one. It's found in a table out in the narthex. It's got more information about our fellowship. Feel free to take one of those as well. Thanks for doing that. This morning's announcements, there will be no children's church 
for service this morning. So children, remain with your families through service, please. And men's group will be meeting Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Our family night is Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Our ladies' event is coming up on April 20th, and there's information in your bulletin for that. Also, if there's a sign-up in the foyer, if you are interested in attending that. Uh, birthdays this week include Lila Tam today and Jody Tam today. Happy birthday to you. And Steve Bortz on Friday. And we have no anniversaries listed for this week. Are there any additional announcements or birthdays? Easter, Easter. Okay. Yep. Uh, so if you have uh, purchased an Easter lily for remembrance, please remember to take those with you when you leave today. Thank you. Please join me as we welcome our Savior this morning. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful to you that you chose to leave heaven, come down to earth, live as a man, face the temptations we face, yet without sin, so that you could be the perfect sacrifice that you offered yourself in replacement for our death that we could live for eternity with you. Thank you for that sacrifice and the suffering you endured for us. We honor you today and I ask that this service would be glorifying to you and you'd be lifted up. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture readings today include Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoner, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And our New Testament reading this morning will be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you're able to, please remain standing as we worship in song.
Please be seated. We have a couple of prayer requests this morning. Um, Brian would like prayer for Kathy as she is not feeling well and she's sad that she can't be here today and he's sad that she's not here today as well so we pray for a quick healing for her. And Cheryl is asking for prayer for her son-in-law Jeff um, who has been in prison for about 40 years and in Dakota and there is a very severe lockdown at the prison so there's no communication between prisoners and families and um, no church services no Bible studies so we're asking for God's intervention in his life and for the others there that God would provide them with a way to draw close to him. Please join me as we bring these prayer requests and anything that's on your heart today to our Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to surrender our sin ask you into our heart and be forgiven I want to lift up Jeff today Lord and his fellow inmates who are in prison there I pray that you would make a way for your light to shine there be it through guards or or a ministry being established there. Pray that you would be working in their hearts, softening their hearts. We know that you're the only true changer of lives. So please be with them and soften their hearts to you and provide the seed so that they can be translated from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of your beloved Son. Lift up Kathy before you this morning who is not feeling well. I ask that you would encourage her and bring her quick healing. I pray for the rest of our body as we have all been dealing with some illness recently that you would provide for health. Please be with the churches in our area. Strengthen them. Help us all to shine your light. Pray for those who don't know you, that they would desire to know you. Please be with our military, men and women who are abroad, and their families who are home. Pray that you'd strengthen them, draw them close to you. Again, if they don't know you, that you would draw them to you so that they might know you. We give you thanks and praise. Offer these requests in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Could I please have the offering ushers come forward? Lord, we're grateful to you that you provide for us each day. Not only finances and provision of place to live and food, but you give us our every breath, and we're grateful to you for that. Help us to honor you with our life and our finances and our gifts and talents. Pray that this offering be used to glorify you and build your kingdom. Jesus name. Amen.
Please take a minute to greet somebody near you and uh, we'll be starting worship momentarily. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thanks to those of you who are joining us online. And uh, it is Easter Sunday. And uh, praise the Lord, He is risen. Amen? Amen. You know, the centerpiece of the Christian faith is the resurrection. You know, you eliminate the resurrection and, and we're just having service. And, uh, but praise God, He has defeated um, sin and death when He rose on the third day. And because of that, we have hope today. And uh, praise God for that. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because we all owed a debt that we could not pay. And uh, so praise God for the resurrection. Um, he died and the death that we all deserved. And um, he rose again with new life to offer us living hope. And so as we celebrate the empty tomb today and, um, and the Christ's resurrection from the dead, you know, we have the benefit of knowing what happened 2,000 years ago. But those early disciples, those early disciples, they were walking through it. And uh, can I just say, at that time, they were probably pretty confused. They were probably overwhelmed, had a lot of pain, lots of sorrow in their hearts and their life. And, um, and so we're going to look at that today. You know, historically speaking, many believed that the Messiah was going to come as a military king much like David or much like Joshua, to defeat the Romans. And so uh, it was certainly surprising to them and disappointing to them when uh, the night that Jesus was arrested, he didn't put up a fight and, um, and such. Mark chapter 14, verse 50 says, when Jesus was arrested, that all of his disciples scattered. They left him. He was all alone. And um, so you can imagine how horrible it felt for them, these disciples, feeling devastated, very sad, confused by all of this. And um, after his arrest, it didn't get any better. There was a sham trial. He was falsely accused, um, sentenced to death, death by crucifixion. Um, he died. They laid him in a tomb. And again, they're just bewildered. They're beside themselves with a sense of hopelessness. Uh, thankfully, though, hopelessness isn't where the story ends. We know the story. And so I want to go this morning to um, Luke chapter 24. I'm going to be in there, uh, read, uh, take care of a good section of that. Um, along with that, though, I, I want you to, um, if you would today, try to get a visual image in your mind of this passage that we're reading and uh, what it would look like if you happen to be there. And so I'm hoping to paint a picture for you as we go through this today. And uh, I want you to be able to feel the emotion that they were experiencing, the joy that they were experiencing, um, all of that. And so, um, so let's get into this today. So Luke chapter 24, and starting out there, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, and uh, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, I see this time as a transitional time. You know that time in the morning when, when darkness is starting to fade away? And, and things are starting to brighten up, things that you're start able to see outside a little bit. Uh, I see that as this time, this transitional time in the morning. The sun hasn't fully up yet. It's still early in the morning. And so it says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down on their, with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them these famous words, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. And uh, how, how glorious that is. 
when you think about that. And, and then thankfully that they had the, the angels there to be able to articulate what's next. And that is, do you not remember what he said to you in Galilee? So in verse number seven, he says that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And, and, and again, picture this if you will. So they get there, the stone's rolled away, his body's gone, the angels show up. Um, you know, they're kind of perplexed, they're kind of bewildered, they're kind of like, what is this all about? And then he says, um, and then they, they speak to them about, you remember when he was with you in Galilee, he told you these things. And as they begin to re, re, uh, remind them about these words, that the Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, I can just see them saying, yes, 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 he's alive. And so they're so excited. They're, they're excited about being able to go back, and they want to go tell the disciples. And so off they go to tell the disciples about this great news, that the empty tomb and friends, the empty tomb is worth talking about. It's worth ex getting excited about, and it's worth telling others about. You know, the empty tomb is and will always be the ultimate reminder that the body of Christ is gone, that he indeed has risen, and he's alive today. And so they were excited. And so the Apostle Paul, in uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a chapter of Scripture that is designated, uh, Paul speaks extensively about the resurrection and um, if you've not been through that chapter in some time, I would encourage you, especially on this day of all days, uh, to spend some time looking at what Paul writes about in regards to the resurrection. And um, we'll look at a couple other verses from this chapter a little later as well. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13 and 14, he said, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Wow. So if the, if the tomb is not empty, we're just going through the motions today, folks. If it wasn't empty. But if it is indeed empty, friends, we have something to get excited about. There's joy. There's excitement. Because our Savior lives. He reigns. And uh, that's something to get excited about. Um, back in Luke 24, and uh, these, this next uh, portion... Um, what happens is, is that the ladies go back. The ladies go back and they tell the disciples, and the disciples, they, they say that it's kind of nonsense. They said, N what are you talking about? His body's gone. And they didn't understand it. It was all too much for them to take in at the moment. And, uh, but it says that Peter, he left at once. He, he ran down to the tomb to find out for himself. And then Luke transitions, and he starts talking to them about um, two guys that are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I love this. And so um, he says there to us, and we'll pick it up in verse number 13. That same day, the two men were um, going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And I want you to remember seven miles. And we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and deliberated, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Um, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And, um, and if you go on from there, it says that those guys kind of looked with a kind of a, a look on their face like, are you serious? Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem? that doesn't know the things that are transpiring these days? And, and to which Jesus said, what things? Which I just think is amazing. Um, so he says, what things? And he says, well, this Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, very powerful and mighty, and, and, and goes on and talks to them about how um, he was handed over, he was betrayed, and, and they crucified him, and they laid him in the tomb, and, and goes on to tell Jesus that not only did they lay him in the tomb, but that the women were down there early this morning, and they went there, and his body's gone. And um, they went back, and, and, and we're not sure what to make of all of this. And, and so, again, they're telling this to Jesus, and they're going along. And Jesus interacts with them some more. And then they finally reach Emmaus. And um, he's about ready to continue to move on and keep going when they convince him to say, hey, listen, it's getting late in the day. Why don't you stay with us? And so he agrees to stay with them, and we'll pick it up in verse 29. Verse 29, again, are you picturing this in your mind? 
Um, you know, all this is transpiring, all these things that are happening. And uh, verse 29, the second half of the verse there, and, and through verse 31. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappears from their sight. Wow. I, again, I'm telling you, it, it, it's pretty exciting. I hope you're getting the picture of this in your mind. These two guys that are sitting there, kind of with looks on their face, with their mouth is probably wide open like, and, and I don't know which one spoke to the other first, but they, they probably asked the same question, did that really just happen? Did you, that, that was Jesus. Did you not under, and now he's gone. I mean, just a just amazing um, interaction here that's going on. Now, these guys were so excited. And um, here's how Luke says that they responded to this in uh, verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Well, we talked, well, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Again, they're so excited. I mean, their Savior lives, um, you know, and, and just like the ladies that went to the empty tomb and, um, and, and saw the empty tomb and, and then had the, uh, the angels speak to them with the good news, and they went back to tell the disciples, so these guys are heading back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what has happened. And how far is Emmaus from Jerusalem? Seven miles. Can you imagine? When was the last time you ran seven miles? Seriously. Some of you are like, I don't know if I ever ran seven miles. Seven miles is a long ways, but you've just been given the greatest news that you've ever had in your whole life. And you cannot wait to tell the disciples. Believe me, you're going to get there as fast as you possibly can. So again, with your minds, try to picture that. you got these disciples. They're traveling and traversing as fast as they can. I can see them maybe getting 100 yards, maybe 200 yards, but probably not too far into it, kind of bent over. <sighs> wait up, wait up, wait up. And, and, and they're out of breath. They finally, after the seven miles, they get there. Um, they're conversing and they're telling the disciples and they're saying, you know what? Um, those ladies were here this morning. They said that Jesus was alive, that he was risen. I want to tell you, he's alive. Matter of fact, he walked with us along the road. We didn't recognize him at first, which is hard to believe. And they're trying to explain that. Explain that, okay? So you're one of his disciples. You should be able to recognize Jesus. And they didn't. But when he gave us that bread, all of a sudden, it's like our eyes were open and we saw him with us. And then he disappeared. So he's, they're trying to explain this to the disciples. And they're trying to, um, you know, say that. And in the midst of them explaining all of this to them, what happens? But Jesus decides to show up. So in the midst of that, they're there, they're speaking to Jesus. I mean, they're speaking about this experience that they had. And all of a sudden, verse 36, Jesus shows up, peace be with you. And, um, and, and now, I mean, again, there's a little bit of fright in them. They're a little bit uncertain. They don't know if they're seeing a ghost. Um, if you read those verses there through verse 43. And at first they were saying, you know, um, they were concerned. And so Jesus said, listen, it is I. Don't be afraid. As a matter of fact, you can see the wounds in my hands. You can see the wound in my side. He said, you know, come and touch me. It is I. It's truly I. I'm not a ghost. He said, because does a ghost have flesh and blood and bones as I do? It's really me, guys. It's really me. And, and again, they, so chances are that the door was probably locked, but either way, Jesus ends up in the room with them, which we get a little bit of a glimpse of his glorified state. Now, I think, uh, and I'm not entirely sure, I mean, yeah, I mean it's, but it's very possible when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, was transfigurated before them, you know the story, right? And so he's transfigurated before them, and, and they have this experience up there, and they're coming down from the mountain, and Jesus says to the guys, now guys, keep this on the down low. Don't tell anybody. Tell it's time. And what I think he gave to them was this, a glimpse of what it was going to be like in his glorified state. You know, we see these glimpses in Scripture, like what is it going to be like when we get to heaven? And uh, we see this, Jesus here, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, standing there, but, he, but yet at the same time he entered the room, most likely right through the wall. I mean, he disappeared with these guys and ended up, 
ended up where else, and now he's here again. And, and so these things are happening. And then Jesus says to him, he says, do, do you have anything to eat? And, and so somebody gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he ate it in their presence. And so we'll pick it up there in verse 44. And this is what I told you while I was still with you. Um, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, that the prophets and the Psalms, and then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Wow, what a powerful thing. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. How awesome would that be to do Bible study with Jesus? How thankful, and, and we know that he, he told them to go there and wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and the power of them to witness and stuff. And we know that the Holy Spirit helps us understand all things and all the things that we've learned, and, and that's part of the role of it. But they understood the Scriptures. He brings it to light, and he's speaking to them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, it says, For um, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, when it says the amen there, the amen means this, so be it. You know, it's an expression of faith. It's an expression of confidence. Um, and in other words, take it to the bank. It's as good as done. It's in your hands, Jesus. Amen. We're committing it to you. And uh, you are, you know, it, so be it um, with that amen. And so you think about um, all the promises. Every one of them is yes in Christ. And through him, we shout amen to the glory of God. Think about all the promises. And uh, certainly the list I'm going to give you here now is certainly not exhaustive. And you could add to this list um, a ton more. But just think about the promises that we have in Scripture, the redemption of our sins. And praise God that Christ was the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf and went to the cross, paid our debt, and our sins can be forgiven. Because of that, we can be reconciled to the heart of the Father. The ministry of reconciliation is spoken of in 2 Corinthians 5. And to restore it back to the heart of the Father. He's promised us an eternal home with Him. We're promised peace. We're promised rest. We're promised healing. We're promised wholeness. No more tears, pain, or sickness. Amen and amen. His constant presence, I will never leave you or forsake you. How awesome is that? Amen. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So thankful for the friendship he talks about. I think of, of John chapter 15 when he tells his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but my, I call you friends. To be a friend of God's. Life and death. I'm going to bring this to a close this morning. And I, and I want, if you would, just give me your attention for the next few minutes. And, you know, we went through some verses you know, this is not only the end of my uh, message this morning, but it's really the end of our, our series that we've talked about and about um, uh, from the ashes, uh, this series we've talked about. And some of the verses that we went through in our pre-service were very intentional today. And uh, we looked at Isaiah. We looked at Isaiah chapter 61, um, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Is there any brokenhearted among us today? To proclaim freedom from the captives, or for the captives, is there anybody here that you feel like you're in a prison? Prison to our fleshly body, our sinful natures. To release from darkness for the prisoner. To proclaim the, the year of the Lord's favor and to the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, anybody who mourn today, and to provide those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor from the ashes a crown of beauty instead of ashes, you know, taking the brokenness of our life, picking us up and making us whole. And praise God for that. Another verse out of Corinthians that we looked at at the opening. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. First importance. 
Nothing else is more important than this truth. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures of first importance. And again, we think about the paradox here. It was what gave us life was Jesus laying down His life so that we could have abundant life, new life. I think of what Jesus told us in the Gospel of John chapter 10. Gospel of John chapter 10. Uh, we read there, and we could read this whole portion, but I'm going to just read verses 10 and 11, then jump back in it and read uh, 17 and 18. You could read through the whole thing, just not going to take the time to do so. But looking here at verse uh, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I'm reminded what it says in 1 Peter 5, 7, that the, he looks for somebody to devour. You know, that, that is his MO, what the enemy wants to do, bring pain and destruction. But going on in that verse here, 10, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Other translations say abundantly. And uh, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. And I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. I have an illustration I want to share this morning. I was finishing up my message, and it was Friday morning, and I just it was lacking something. I was just kind of wrestling with it. I said, you know, i got to find something. i got to find an illustration that helps me. I, I just didn't like how I had it finished up. And so Dawn had shared with me that she saw this post and one that Julie Poy put out there. So you might have even read this already. And if you have, you'll, I'll give you my version of this story. And um, because it helps illustrate this point. And, um, and so uh, there was a certain professor who taught religion. And um, his name was Dr. Christensen, who taught at a, a small college out west. He taught survey to Christianity, and this was a required course for all freshmen that entered that school. Now, although um, he tried very hard to make this class interesting and exciting, most of the students saw it as just something of, of uh, a required drudgery that they had to get through. And so despite the best efforts of the professor, most students refused to take Christianity serious. And um, now in his class that particular year, he had a, a, a student by the name of Steve, and Steve was a, um, a student who was there studying and uh, was going to enter the seminary and enter ministry um, at some point. And so Steve was very popular. He was well-liked by the student body. Um, he was the starting center on their football team, very physically strong and such. Um, and he was also one of the best and was the best student in the professor's class. And um, so the professor had an idea that came to him, and he thought, you know, what can I do to really help my students understand and grasp the importance of our relationship with the Lord? And so he kind of came up with this idea, and probably Holy Spirit inspired. And um, so he happened to ask Steve to stay after class one day, and he said, you know, would you stay after class? And, and um, he said, uh, Steve, he said, how many push-ups can you do? And he says, well, I don't know. He says, I do 200 every night. And he says, wow, that's pretty impressive. He said, do you think you could do 300? He says, well, I don't know. I only do 200. He says, but if you had to, you, do you think you could do 300 push-ups? He says, well, I might, uh, you know. And he says, well, how about if you did 300 push-ups, but break it down into sets of 10? Do you think you could do sets of 10 and do a total of 300 push-ups? He says, well, I, I reckon I can do that. He said, all right, and so then he explained to him what he wanted to do in this project, and he said, so um, come this Friday, we're going we're gonna to put this, I'm going to do this thing with my class. And so Friday came, uh, Steve got there extra early, sat in the front row, um, the doctor, I mean, the professor started his class, and uh, when he started his class, now his class was the last class of the day on Friday, so they're getting ready to go to the weekend, and so he thought he's going to have a little party. And so he brought a huge box of donuts, and they weren't just the normal donuts, but these donuts were the big fancy donuts that had cream in them. They had all the nice frosting and everything else, and so I'm um, explained to his class that, you know, they're going to have this party, and, 
and such. And so he started in the first row, started on the one side, got to Cynthia and said, Cynthia, would you like a donut? And so Cynthia said, yes, I'd love a donut. And he says, great. Steve, would you do 10 push-ups for Cynthia so she can have a donut? Steve jumped off his chair, got down, did his 10 push-ups, sat back in his chair, gave Cynthia her donut, went to, Je- went to Joe, the next one in line. Joe, would you like a donut? Well, yes, I would. Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Joe can have a donut? And so he did his 10 push-ups, and, and uh, the professor continued to make his way down the first row, and, um, you know, Steve, he's just rattling off those push-ups one after the other, just uh, fine, but you could start seeing the sweat start coming out. So he finished out row number one. He started row number two. He goes down there and started across the row until he got about halfway across row number two, and he got to Scott. Now, Scott was also an athlete, uh, quite a standout on the basketball team, and, um, you know, very strong and very well-liked with the student body. Didn't have a shortage of people in his life. And, um, and so um, he asked, well, you know, they asked, well, would you, Scott, would you like a donut? And he says, well, can I do my own push-ups? To which the professor said, no, that isn't how it works. Um, he says, well, then I don't want one. Well, okay. And so he looked to Steve and he said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Scott can have a donut that he does not want? <laughs> and, um, and so, in and, and full obedience, uh, Steve started doing the push-ups and he, he got halfway through the push-ups and, and Scott said, hey, hey, I said I didn't want one. And to which the professor says, well, this is my classroom, and this is my class, and these are my desks, and this is, these are my donuts. And so, if you don't want it, just leave it on the desk. Steve, finish. Steve finished his push-ups, went to the next person. And now, now all of a sudden, there's more people that started saying no. And he said, you know, and, and, and each time, but he did push-ups, 10 push-ups for each person going down the row. He finished out row number two, started row number three, same thing, went down there, and uh, person after person, would you like a donut, um, you know, and, and such. And uh, all the way through row three. Now he's starting row four. There's only four rows. He's kind of nearing the end. And now there's some excitement, the excitement in the class, but yet at the same time, and, and you got to understand, Steve's starting to show his, I mean, it's been a lot of push-ups. And so you could see the perspiration coming down his face. His face was red. His arms were, you know, red and stuff. He's doing these push-ups. And, um, and they were coming a little bit slower now for him, physically exhausted. And, um, and people were hearing the commotion from the other classes that were in the hall, and a few students made their way into the class. And so a few extra students came into the class, and they sat on the outside wall, and, and uh, the professor's starting to think to himself, oh, I don't know. You know, Steve's starting to show his wear already, and we're getting more students come in. And so they're continuing to make their way down row number three, And all of a sudden, Jason shows up at the doorway. Jason shows up at the doorway. He's a transfer student, and um, he's wondering what's going on, and he's ready to come in. And um, and so as he's getting ready to come in, they say, no, don't come in. (laughs) And so uh, Jason's not sure what to do, and Steve lifted his head, said, let him come in. And to which the professor turned to Steve and said, Steve, you realize if he comes in, you got to do 10 push-ups for him too. He said, let him in. And so Steve, or Jason came in. Jason, do you want a donut? And, and again, he's kind of not sure what all that's going on. He's not sure what's transpired already. And he said, sure. He said, all right, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Jason can have a donut? Did his 10 push-ups. And again, now they're becoming more laborsome. They're tired. He's tired. He's getting to the end of himself. He finishes out the row three into row four, finishing out row four. Now he's only got just a few left. He's got those that have wandered in from outside. He's got four more to do. So the teacher made his way over to them, and there was, and they started doing them. And again, there's, you could see that um, Steve was really starting to show his wear. And now there's just a couple students left. And um, he gets to Linda. And, uh, Linda is the second to last person. She's a cheerleader along with the other gal there, Susan, which would be the last person here. And, um, and asks, you know, Linda, Linda, would you like a donut? And she says, oh, no, thank you. And um, Steve, would you please do 10 push-ups so that Linda can have a donut she doesn't want? 
He does his push-ups. But it's becoming harder and harder for him to finish these out. And then Susan's the last one. And by this time, most of the kids in the, the class had tears in their eyes, including the professor. He says to Su Susan, Susan, would you like a donut? And tears coming down her face. She said, Dr. Christensen, why can't I help him? Why can't I help him? The professor said with tears in his own eyes, no, nope. Steve has to do it alone. I've given him this task, and he is in charge of seeing that everyone has an opportunity for a donut, whether they want it or not. When we decided, or when I decided to have this party, this last day of class, I looked at my grade book. Steve is the only student with a perfect grade. Everyone else has failed to test, skipped a class, or offered me inferior work. Steve told me that on the football field, when somebody messed up, they had to do push-ups. I told Steve that none of um, you could come to my party unless he paid the price by doing your push-ups. He and I made a deal for your sake. Steve, would you do 10 push-ups for Susan? Can I have a donut? As Steve finished out his donuts with every last ounce of strength to finish him off, extremely exhausted, having done 350 push-ups that day, his arms buckled beneath him, he fell to the floor. Dr. Carlson, or Dr. Um, Christensen, rather, turned to the room and said, and so it was that our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross, pled to the Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. With the understanding that he has done everything that was required of him, he yielded up his life. And like some of those in the room, many of us leave the gift on the desk uneaten. Two students help Steve off the floor, physically exhausted, but still wearing a thin smile. Well done, good and faithful student, said the professor, adding this, not all sermons are preached with words. Turning to his class, the professor said, my wish is that you might understand and fully comprehend all the riches of grace and mercy that have been given to you through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ for all of us now and forevermore. Whether or not you choose to accept his gift to us, the price has been paid. You'd be foolish and ungrateful to leave it on the desk. A couple other scriptures, and we'll bring this to a close this morning. One scripture that comes to mind, and it's uh, Romans 5.8. Romans chapter 5, 8, when it says that God demonstrated his own love for us, that when we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we are at our worst, unlovable, Christ went to the cross, died in our place. We're told in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and verse 13, that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're talking today and have talked quite at length about the sacrifice Christ was on our behalf and the fact that he conquered sin and death when he rose from the dead. The, you know, the resurrection, again, if he didn't raise from the dead, then we're just going through the motions today. And uh, we're just a nice social club gathering together. But if Christ is indeed raised from the dead, it brings us hope. He's defeated death, sin and death once and for all. He offers to us this thing we call salvation, but we have to accept it. It's a gift. And uh, you can't earn it, you can't buy it. For one, it's not for sale, and there's, you possibly couldn't do enough to ever earn it. The only thing you can do is receive it. And you receive it by accepting the fact that Christ went, and you acknowledge and say, yes. 
First of all, you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner, which the Word of God says we all are. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When we understand that, asking Jesus to come into our heart, our life, forgive us of our sins, be our Lord, our Savior. He makes us a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It's an awesome thing. And um, if you've not come to that place, I want to just read a verse here and then... um, Again, this would speak to, you can't earn it, you can't buy it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace, grace, that you've been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Again, because if we could do it in our own strength, believe me, we'd probably all try. Because that's just how we're wired. But you can't. It's a gift. The only thing you can do is receive it and um, ask him to come into your heart and your life, forgive you of your sins. And uh, I, I can't think of a better day of the year than if you're outside of a relationship with the Lord than to have this day be your day when you profess your faith in Jesus Christ and, and enter the family of God. Um, of all days, Easter, what a great day. And um, just pray a prayer sim- sim- simple as this. Father God, I recognize that I have fallen short and I've sinned. Lord, I thank you that you went to the cross to be the sacrifice on my behalf so that my sins can be paid and I can be forgiven. I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, make me a new creation. I choose to serve you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, He told us ahead of time. He told the disciples what he was going to do, just as we talked about earlier today. And do you not remember when you were in Galilee? He said he was going to go. He was going to be handed over to the into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Friends, he's also told us this. He's also told us he's coming back. Let us not forget that either. He's coming back. We need to be ready for him. And, um, you know, and that's, that's why it's important. Jesus said uh, to us that uh, he is the way to truth of life. No one comes to the Father except through him. It's important that we make that declaration of faith before he comes back. <laughs> and, um, and so when we do that, and so he's coming back, we can be thankful for that. And uh, what a great day to celebrate. I'm so happy that you've chosen to be with us today. I'm going to ask us to stand this morning. Alicia's going to come and we're going to sing this last song. And this last song is just an anthem of praise. And I I pray that it it comes from a heart that's overflowing with gratitude and excitement for all that Christ has done for you and all that he means to you. And um, and I'm going to pray and and, um, we'll... uh, Father God, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for Jesus. And I thank you for his sacrifice and what it has meant and means to us this day. And Lord God, I just pray that, Father, it resonates in our heart. God, and it, it not only did you tell them about what you were going to do, you've also told us, Lord, that you're going to come back for your church and the importance for us to be in that right relationship with you. And so, Lord, we just say, come, Lord Jesus. Again, we just love you and we thank you. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen.
church, he's still alive. Amen. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father, waiting for his instruction. And so God bless you. Just like the guys from Emmaus that uh, had the uh, encounter with Jesus, just like the ladies who were at the tomb that got the instruction, they had to go and tell somebody. And uh, if you find somebody today that needs to hear, be a, a beacon of light for the Savior today. Tell them he is still alive. Amen? God bless you. Hey, um, those that uh, got lilies, don't forget to take those with you on the way out. Also, the refreshment table will be open. We just ask that there's a lot of, there's some chocolate and some other things on there. Try to be, uh, um, to not spill on the floor, please. Thank you. <laughs> Rachel will appreciate that. 